My name is Anna Siefkin. I'm the Executive Director for the Scott Institute for Energy Innovation. We're so glad to have you here today to introduce our guest speaker. We have Jackie Speedy. Jackie is the Associate Dean of the School of Public Policy and Management at the Heinz College of Information Systems and Public Policy. As Associate Dean, Speedy is responsible for oversight of all the master's programs within the Heinz College School of Public Policy and Management, including the Master's of Science in Public Policy and Management, the Master of Public Management, the Master of Science in Healthcare Policy and Management, and the Master of Medical Management. I think I got all of those. Um, Speedy was honored um, a few years back as one of Pittsburgh Magazine's 40 Under 40 for her service to the Pittsburgh community. So with that, Jackie Speedy. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, and welcome to all of you today. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome our distinguished alumnus, uh, Joe Heizer, here with us this afternoon. So as most of you know, Joe served as the Chief Financial Officer and Senior Advisor to the Secretary of Energy from 2013 to 2017. As CFO, Mr. Heizer led a 200-purse organization and a budget of $30 billion for the Department of Energy. His responsibilities included budgeting, uh, strategic planning, programming, and budget formulation and, and execution. Upon leaving the Department of Energy, we're lucky enough to have Joe return to Carnegie Mellon, his alma mater, uh, serving as a professor of practice for the Scott Institute. He earned both his chemical engineering and public policy degrees from Carnegie Mellon, and now he's able to return home, as, as it were. Um, and in this role, he's advising Scott Institute leaders in strategic planning, including the development of ob objectives, including uh, energy efficiency policies for advanced manufacturing, and other such policies that we will lead into the future. Joe is the managing principal partner of Energy Futures Initiative, which is a nonprofit energy policy think tank that was funded by the former Secretary of Energy, Ernest, Ernest Moniz. He is responsible for leading studies and analyses in energy finance and technology issues. He's a co author on reports that inform the national security imperative for, for commercial nuclear energy, the application of DOE loan grantee programs to finance innovation in energy infrastructure, the assessment of tax credits in advancing carbon capture and storage, and finally, the potential of something that's very Carnegie Mellon-esque, uh, blockchain for energy application markets. Mr. Heizer will talk with us today about the emerging role of carbon dioxide removal technologies and the role they'll play in addressing climate change in the future. It's a bit of a sneak peek. I would also like to ask you before we begin to keep your cell phones um, away today, since this is um, a new initiative that has not yet been launched publicly. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Joe Heizer. Thank you, Jackie. Um, I'm really pleased to be here today to talk to you about a, a topic that is kind of an emerging topic that uh, probably a lot in the environmental community are not thinking a whole lot about right now, but one that we think is going to become increasingly important, and that's the, the topic of carbon dioxide removal. That is, removing carbon dioxide that's already been emitted into the environment, whether it's the uh, atmosphere or the oceans. And what I'm going to speak to you about today is a project that Energy Futures Initiative has undertaken over the course of about the past year. Um, we have uh, gotten uh, special funding grants to do this work uh, from the Linden Trust for Conservation based in New York and the uh, Climate Works Foundation based in, in San Francisco. And uh, as Jackie alluded to, uh, we have a report that we're still in final editing stage right now that we will be releasing a week from today uh, in New York. Uh, Secretary Moniz will be making a presentation and an event uh, next Tuesday morning in New York when we will do the formal uh, public release. So what I'm going to give you today is a little bit of a uh, dry run and a little more detail than obviously than what we'll talk about in New York. Um, but uh, so with that in mind, uh, I ask you to keep the, you know, what we're going to talk about today in confidence and uh, also recognize that it's still 
even though it's only a week away, it's still a little bit of a, a work in progress. Uh, so we'll be still, uh, still be tinkering with this. So let me go to the first slide here. And this is kind of sort of three questions that I'm going to address today with respect to carbon dioxide removal. And I'm going to do this in a little different order, starting out first with why we're even talking about carbon dioxide removal, and then talk a little bit about what carbon dioxide removal really means in terms of various options and approaches. And then last but not least, the question of the how. And the how is really the bulk of the presentation today. And it was really the focus of the uh, project that we were uh, funded to do. Because basically what we were asked to do is to say, if you take all of the various scientific ideas for how to deal with carbon dioxide removal, how can you take that and convert that into a federal, federally funded research initiative? And of course, obviously, the reason that we're doing this, given the fact that uh, we've asked the, the former Secretary of Energy to lead this project and myself, the former CFO, a lot of the project had to do with the governance issues and the mechanics, the funding, the organization and management for a, a research initiative. So, but let me go ahead and start off and talk a little bit about the why. And so, why do we care about removing carbon dioxide that's already in the environment? And there's really two principal reasons, and I'll talk a little bit more about each one. One, first is obviously, uh, there's a lot of efforts underway now globally and, and even in the US to mitigate uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, the Paris Agreement uh, set a limit of trying to reach to uh, hold temperature increases to 2 degrees C, uh, with a lot of ambition to go even lower than that. Um, but what we're finding, and I'll show you some slides in a moment, is that uh, we're a long ways from getting there. So carbon dioxide removal becomes a way to complement and augment what uh, strategies for mitigating emissions. Secondly, it's an opportunity to actually address the atmospheric concentration that's already there. In other words, this is in part really to address the problems of the past, the, the, the emissions that have been emitted over time. Uh, and even if we were to get to zero emissions today, uh, we would still need to be thinking about taking some of the CO2 that's there out of the atmosphere because CO2 is a very long-lived gas in the, in, in the, uh, in the atmosphere. And uh, concentrations continue to rise. And we're probably on a trajectory right now where we're, by most modeling, would be at a 1.5 degree average temperature increase um, by 2030, which is roughly 10 years from now. So let me just kind of show you a couple examples of why this is important. First is that this is a report done by the UN in 2017. This was related to a, a two degree temperature increase scenario. And even in that scenario, um, the modeling showed that even with all the various mitigation measures that were available, um, to get down to uh, zero net uh, emissions by the end of the century, we would still need to have negative emissions or carbon dioxide removal. Um, and, and so that's just sort of one example of how CDR, if you will, will complement mitigation. Another example is what's happening right now with the Paris Agreement. And, and of course, all of you know there's a lot of controversy about that. We now have 195 countries that initially signed up to the agreement. 185 have since ratified it. Um, but even with the ratification of those 185 countries, um, those commitments, those nationally determined commitments, uh, would only achieve about one-third of the reductions needed to get even to that two-degree C line. And when you look at what these countries are actually doing, particularly the major emitting countries, as of 2018, um, about two-thirds of them were still not even on track to meet what they had committed to in 2015. And it actually, for the last year in 2018, we saw both in the U.S. and globally uh, greenhouse gas emissions rising a small amount. So the good news, though, is that in the U.S., I think you, everyone is aware that the administration has announced its intention to withdraw from that agreement. But we do have uh, 10 states, 
almost 300 cities and counties, uh, over 350 colleges and universities, and over 2,000 businesses who have still pledged to follow commitments to stay in the Paris commitment. And that is something that, again, at EFI, we're continuing to, to work with some of these uh, entities in that regard. Also, I just wanted to point out that there's been an increasing movement now to what we call for higher ambition. There have been two states, California and New York, and uh, several other states and a number of cities who are saying that even getting to the Paris commitments are got, not going to be enough. And that what really has to happen is that we really need to be thinking about net zero uh, carbon emissions by mid-century. And right now, this is a map that shows the uh, states and the cities, entities that have already made that commitment. Uh, two states, New York and California, have made a zero carbon commitment economy-wide. Several of these other states, like Nevada, uh, New Mexico, Maine, have made this commitment only for the power sector. Uh, but again, in looking at how to get to zero, one needs to think about carbon dioxide removal or net uh, negative emissions because there are going to be some very hard sectors to decarbonize, such as in industry, aviation, and, and some others like that, maritime. So, and then last but not least, we need to think about the fact that the, uh, we're seeing more and more various effects of climate change, and many in the scientific community are pointing to various examples of what we call tipping points. So the change is not occurring gradually. It's not occurring in a linear fashion. This is just one example uh, that we're showing in the report of what's happened to Bering Sea Ice and how rapidly uh, the sea ice cover um, uh, in the north has been uh, uh, diminishing. Uh, another recent example is uh, ocean temperatures. You know, we talk about glo average global warming, and one thinks of it as a relatively uniform process, but what we are seeing now in the oceans is that there's hot spots occurring where temperatures are increasing much faster than in other areas. And so as we progress on this now, we're seeing more and more evidence of these tipping points, which just provides further motiv motivation for having all the tools in the toolbox that we can. So let me shift gears. So that's kind of the why question. So let me now address kind of the what question. So w what is carbon dioxide removal? Well, simply stated, it's, and some people refer to it as negative emissions technologies, but basically what it is, it's removing CO2 that's already in the environment, primarily from the atmosphere, but also directly from the oceans as well, because CO2 is an equilibrium uh, between oceans and, uh, and the atmosphere. Uh, and then it's storing it in some fashion, whether it's in plants, in minerals, in subsurface geology, or in ocean waters and sediments, or converting it into uh, some form of a useful product that will keep it isolated from the environment. When people talk about carbon dioxide removal, uh, think about it really in three forms. Um, one is sort of nat the natural carbon cycle. Plants and trees absorb carbon as they grow. Um, and so one way to get more carbon dioxide removal is to have more plants and trees. Uh, but there's also technological means, both technologically enhanced and what we call hybrid. And these are things like uh, modifying plants so that they, so it's not a matter of planting more crops and trees, but rather developing new strains of crops and uh, plants and trees that can actually absorb more carbon per unit, uh, uh, particularly through root systems and stored in the soil. Uh, it also involves modifying uh, ocean chemistry, whether it's uh, fertilization or other forms. And there could be hybrid approaches as well. The most commonly known to that is uh, bioenergy with carbon capture and sequestration, where biomass is used as an energy source and then uh, when it is converted either to uh, a gas or a liquid fuel or it's burned directly, the carbon from that is captured and then sequestered. Uh, and then last but not least are direct technologically ap approaches, the main one being direct air capture. So in our study, we focus on the latter two. 
the whole purpose of our study was to look at technological CDR. Um, and whether it was in technologically enhanced or direct technological approaches. What we did not do is in this study is that we were looking at carbon dioxide removal from, uh, as I said, from the atmosphere and the oceans. We did not look at uh, carbon capture from emissions. And clearly, the, uh, and when, when we talk about some of the research areas, there's some overlap there, but that was not part of the scope of our study. Um, although clearly when carbon is captured from emissions, it can be sequestered or utilized in the same manner as if it's captured from the uh, atmosphere. And then the other thing we did not look at is there's a, there are other techniques to modify climate. Uh, for example, uh, doing things with the atmosphere to reduce the amount of solar radiation that penetrates or, ch or uh, artificially modify weather patterns. Um, those were not part of our scope. We were focused on options that address the carbon cycle directly, not necessarily other things that might address climate without necessarily addressing uh, the carbon cycle. So this is a little cartoon that shows what the different pathways are that we looked at. And, it, and the three boxes in the middle are the natural, the technologically enhanced, and the technological. Uh, and again, our focus was on the bottom two boxes, the technologically enhanced and the technological. And then the boxes on the right-hand side then show the various disposition paths, whether it was disposal in some form or other or uh, utilization. And I'm going to talk about each one of these in a, in a little more detail here um, in, uh, in just a moment. So this is sort of to give you sort of um, in, in some, uh, particularly in Defense Department briefings, they call it the bottom line up front, uh, which is, OK, tell me the answer, and then tell me all the details. So in this slide here is basically, I tried to capture in one slide what it is that we are going to be recommending, which is a comprehensive 10-year research, development, and demonstration initiative, federally funded, looking at multiple pathways for carbon dioxide removal. The goal of which would be to bring one or more of these pathways to commercial readiness within a 10-year period. And further, we've set two particular criterion for things that we want to fund with this initiative. These are approaches that can reduce and, uh, if deployed commercially, have the potential to uh, capture and sequester more than a gigaton of carbon dioxide per year. And secondly, we have set out for this program some very specific cost targets for how much it's going to cost in terms of dollars per ton for removal. The idea would be to have a very focused and highly disciplined research initiative. In looking across the spectrum of federal agencies, there's actually 10 federal agencies that have some mission responsibility and in fact in some cases have actually sponsored some research that's either directly or indirectly relevant to carbon dioxide removal. And we want to encompass the research missions, the research capabilities and infrastructure of all 10 of those agencies. In addition, in addition to those 10 research agencies, we have two agencies in the Executive Office of the President the Office of Science and Technology Policy and the Office of Management and Budget, who also would play key roles in coordinating this effort. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. We put together a very detailed budget estimate for this effort, and we think it's going to cost a little over $10 billion over the 10-year period, uh, with about 300, a little over $300 million in the first year, ramping up to about a billion dollars or a little bit more per year. And we put together a specific a detailed portfolio, which I'll go through in a little more detail in a second, that identifies how a program would be organized based on the various pathways for carbon dioxide removal, how carbon dioxide, once captured, how it would be uh, the disposition of that carbon dioxide, and then thirdly, some programmatic elements that are really kind of cross-cutting in nature that affect all technologies. So I'm going to get now go into the kind of the how uh, of how we're going to do this. And what we did as a starting point, and this is specifically 
what we were asked to do in our study was that there have been a number of studies in the last few years looking at the science of carbon dioxide removal. So we were asked to do a survey of what all of those scientific ideas were and start from there. So we did not invent our own science here, but rather saying, taking all of this various science, scientific ideas that exist, how do we package those into a research program? And uh, these six reports here are six of the major reports that we relied upon. The one here in the top, uh, in the middle, is the um, October 2018 report from the National Academy of Sciences, which was probably the most comprehensive report on this topic. The one to the left of it was done by a UN organization that did a very detailed uh, review of uh, ocean uh, carbon dioxide removal. And below that were some reports specifically on uh, direct air capture. So we started with that science base. And what we did was we then created this portfolio. And we said, OK, if one were to organize a research program from all of these ideas, how do you put it together? And we ended up with a, uh, a program organization that has these four major pathways, uh, direct air capture, terrestrial and biological capture, carbon mineralization, and coastal and oceans capture. We also then identified two disposition paths, whether it's geologic sequestration of the CO2 or CO2 conversion into some form of utilization. Uh, these two disposition paths are very important for things like direct air capture and biological capture because those processes only capture the carbon. They don't, they don't store them. Other approaches like oceans and terrestrial both capture and store. And then last but not least, um, we've identified some very important cross-cutting um, uh, programs that we think would be important to make this initiative work. And I'm going to then now walk through each of these top line elements in a little more detail and talk a little bit more about each one of them. Um, so but before I do, let me go back to my two criterion. So in identifying things that would go into the portfolio, as I said, we had two criteria in mind. One is, would this alternative have the potential to capture CO2 at a gigaton scale and secondly, can it meet a cost target? So uh, there have been studies by the UN, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and by the National Academy of Sciences, all saying that carbon dioxide removal, whether it's by mid-century or end of century, needs to be deployed at gigaton scale. Um, the estimates here in the top line, these are from the Academy study, 10 gigatons a year by 2050, 20 gigatons a year by 2100. And so the question is, what's a gigaton? Well, that's 10 to the ninth tons. But when you think about it is, that's an incredibly large amount quantity of material that we're talking about. And just to kind of put it into context, one gigaton of CO2 emissions is about equal to all of the current CO2 emissions from the light duty fleet in the US. It's also equivalent to the amount of carbon dioxide that could be captured if we captured 90% of all the uh, CO2 emissions from our existing US coal-fired uh, power plant fleet. Um, and then when you think about how you're going to manage a gigaton of CO2 once you captured it, the volumes are just really amazing. Um, if you were to inject CO2 underground and you would have to liquefy it into a super critical liquid, um, we've calculated that one gigaton would be equal to 8 billion barrels. Well, what's 8 billion barrels? Well, that's twice the amount of oil that's produced in the US in one year. It's also um, one half of all the steel that's produced globally. So if one were to ever have a commercial carbon dioxide removal industry, it would have to operate ultimately on the scale of the petroleum industry or the steel industry, or another analogy we could have used here would have been the cement industry. So we're talking about potentially something that would just be at a, just an amazing scale. And that's something that you need to think about very carefully. And, and I know when we did this work, I must have gone over these calculations at least a half a dozen times 
because I could never believe the numbers on it. But, but they are what they are, and we've had it uh, uh, especially peer-reviewed to, to validate that. The other target that we used in our R&D portfolio is cost targets. And the question is, what's it going to cost per ton to remove CO2 from the environment and then sequester it? The bars on the left were the range of cost estimates that the National Academy of Sciences reported in their October 2018 report. And if you look at the different options like mineralization, they had a wide range of options depending upon the various techniques of up to as much as $5,000 a ton. Uh, for direct air capture, they had a number be, uh, between $90 and $600 per ton. And then for some of the other options, much lower numbers. We did some analysis, and based on what we think is the technological potential that could be achieved in an R&D program, set the, the targets on the right uh, that we wanted to try and achieve in this R&D effort. For oceans and terrestrial types of carbon dioxide removal, they're fairly cheap. Uh, there's other factors that will govern how much you can do there. Uh, and then on the right-hand side, for direct air capture and mineralization, we set a target of uh, $200 a ton or less. And then again, just to put those numbers into perspective, we compared those numbers to some of the various legislative proposals that are currently existing for carbon pricing. As all of you know in the room right now, today there's no price on carbon. So consequently, in thinking about the economics of carbon dioxide removal, absent a car cost of price for on carbon, there's really no economic incentive to do this today unless one could create some very valuable, high value added product. But if you look at those various curves, these are a series of legislative proposals that are currently active in Congress, uh, or at least active in the sense that they've been introduced bills. And the dot dash lines are the dash lines that we set as the um, cost targets for the various R&D alternatives for carbon dioxide removal. And what we're showing here is that if we can get to these targets within 10 years and we get ultimately some carbon climate policy in effect in the US, whether it's a carbon price or some other requirement that would be the equivalent of a carbon price, then in fact there would be a potential uh, commercial deployment uh, potential for these uh, various uh, uh, alternatives. So let me now go and talk a little bit about the individual alternatives and what they mean and what some of the research needs might be. And I'll start with DAC, direct air capture. <laughs> this slide shows, relatively speaking, in, in a kind of a visual, what the concentration of CO2 is in the atmosphere relative to what the CO2 concentration would be in the um, uh, combustion off gases um, uh, or the, or the from an industrial or a power plant. So I, if one were having an ethanol plant right now, the off gas there is 95% CO2. Looking down below a coal-fired power plant, the CO2 concentration in the stack gas is probably around 15%. Looking at the CO2 concentration in ambient air, the concentration is is 0.04%. So one would look at this chart and say, well, geez, you know, as an engineer, why am I going after that CO2 molecule in the bottom right-hand corner when I should be going after the CO2 molecules in those other quadrants? And the answer is, you need to do both. And, uh, but it just kind of illustrates some of the challenges, technically, of going after that CO2 molecule that's in the ambient air. There are right now uh, some ideas for two main ways to capture CO2 from the atmosphere. One is called a high temperature liquid solvent system. And I won't go through all the details here, but basically it's, it's a scrubber where ambient air is, is processed through a contactor with uh, potassium uh, hydroxide. The potassium hydroxide is converted into a calcium carbonate. And then the CO2 is, is heated and the CO2 is liberated 
from the calcium carbonate, and the calcium carbonate is converted back to uh, calcium, which then liberates the, the sodium to go back and be recycled in the scrubber. A lot of this technology, as I understand it, or at least some of this research, was actually initially done here on this campus. Uh, the company that's now working on this is uh, called Carbon Engineering that has a small pilot plant in uh, British Columbia. The other uh, process is called low temperature solid absorb absorbent. And this is a, a process that exists of large fans that, that process air over a solid material that has a sorbent uh, uh, adhered to the uh, material. And then what's happened is then the material is then either heated or, um, uh, or either through temperature or moisture, it liberates the CO2 from the absorbent material. The advantage of it is it, it operates at a much lower temperature, which I'll show you in a moment, um, but it requires a lot more um, air processing. The, one of the big issues with CO2 capture from the atmosphere is energy intensity. Because it is in such a low concentration, you have to pro uh, process large volumes of air in order to capture that carbon. And um, this just shows you uh, the relative amounts of energy for the two processes that I just mentioned. But I think what's really interesting are the light blue bars because the energy that's needed for direct air capture is process heat, not necessarily electricity. It's also, electricity is also important, but it's mostly process heat. So one could say, well, geez, we can build these direct air capture machines and power them with very cheap uh, solar PV systems. But the problem is you're only addressing the, uh, the dark blue bars. You're not addressing the light blue bars. So low cost process heat is really critical. And for the high temperature liquid sorbent process on the left, it's not only process heat, but it's high temperature process heat, typically on, on the order of about 900 degrees C. We did a literature review of the various cost estimates that have been reported to date for direct air capture. And there's a lot of controversy in this area. Um, there's estimates as high as $1,000 a ton. And that on the very right hand side, one of the uh, vendors who is developing a technology, Global Thermostat, has said that they can produce uh, capture CO2 for $50 a ton, but they've yet to publish very much detail about uh, the basis for their assumption. Um, the second bar to the left is the range that was published by the National Academy of, of Sciences, $90 to $600. And we use that as our starting point. Um, in, in our thinking about where the, where the economics of uh, DAC would occur. So in thinking about cost reduction, you need to think about well, where, where are the costs that you want to take out of the system. And when you think about the two alternatives, they're very different. On the left hand side is the high temperature system that's sort of the high temperature liquid scrubber system. And then when you look at the capital cost elements for that system, a lot of it's very conventional chemical processing type equipment, uh, calciners, scrubbers, separation units, et cetera. On the right hand side, as a breakdown of the cost estimates for this low temperature system, and it's primarily in the sorbent. And so when you think about those different approaches, it begins to give you some insights in thinking about, well, where are the R&D needs? Where do you need to focus the research in order to really tackle, um, tackle the cost challenges. So the other thing I just wanted to show you is that right now we do have a number of companies who are experimenting with direct air capture systems. A lot of it is outside the US. The, most, the one that's probably done the most work is a company called Climeworks. It's the third one down. It's a Swiss-based company that they've now deployed uh, I don't know, at least a half a dozen small scale systems, mostly in Europe. And typically, the way they solve their problem of getting their process heat is they locate their equipment next door to some sort of a power plant or incinerator or something where they can um, take uh, for free or very low cost the uh, waste heat from those uh, systems. Um, the one I mentioned earlier at the top, carbon engineering, 
Um, it's actually a Canadian company, but again, a lot of the research and innovation has really came here in the US, including from Carnegie Mellon and actually also from uh, Harvard. And they have a small plant out in British Columbia. Um, most of the ones that are currently functioning in this space are using the solid sorbent approach. Carbon engineering is the only one using the high temperature um, liquid approach right now. And all of them are looking primarily to find ways to convert this CO2 into a product in order to find a revenue stream to offset the cost. So that brings me to this slide, which I tried to, to just summarize on one slide. OK, what would be a research program in direct air capture? And clearly, if one were to think about this research portfolio that we're recommending, our principal objectives are addressing cost and performance. The biggest challenges that we have to overcome is the energy and process heat intensity. We also have to deal with the question about air handling, because we're talking about massive quantities of air handling. And we also have to think about absorber materials. Right now, most of these processes, particularly ones for the solid sorbent, are using amines, amines as the primary sorbent. Amines were developed for carbon capture for flue gases, and they're now being adapted here. But over time, in looking at this uh, application, uh, there may be opportunities there for a completely different classes of materials. So we've identified uh, in our portfolio five areas of research. Some fundamental research clearly on materials and design. Um, applied R&D focusing on the energy problem and how one could minimize energy requirements or find ways to utilize uh, low carbon heat. Because remember, you also not only want uh, uh, process heat, but you want zero carbon process heat. Um, third thing that we are recommending is a series of techno-economic assessments. In other words, you have all of these pilot facilities out there. You have some reported claims in the literature, some that have a lot of detail behind it, some of which have very little detail behind it. Uh, one of the things we've talked about with the Department of Energy, uh, NETL, was them trying to put together a comprehensive techno-economic assessment of uh, DAC technologies. They are currently doing one right now for the carbon engineering process, and I think they are going to release some results on it, I think, sometime this fall. Um, the other thing that we're recommending is regional test facilities. The performance of DAC is temperature dependent, it's moisture dependent, so how a system operates in Arizona and how it operates in a northern climate are going to be very different, and one needs to think about that. And then last but not least, we need to think about from a government standpoint whether or not the government should be funding any more large-scale demonstration projects. And we do have some recommendations to do that, but we think that there needs to be four or five years of more, uh, uh, more early stage research done first before you get to that decision point. So um, I spent a lot of time on DAC because that's an area that I think right now tends to get the most attention in terms of carbon dioxide removal. I do want to kind of cover over some of the other areas as well, and perhaps a little more quickly. And let me talk a little bit now about terrestrial uh, carbon dioxide removal. This side shows various fluxes to the environment right now from various anthropogenic sources here on the left and on the right, what's happening in terms of net, currently in terms of net terrestrial fluxes. And when you look across there right now, forestry is the largest by far net sink for CO2 of about 700 megatons uh, of CO2 per year. And so the question is, what can be done to make those numbers on the right-hand side much larger? Uh, and again, as I said, we're not looking necessarily at planting more trees or or planting more crops, but rather technologically what can be done. One of the things that is kind of an interesting area of research right now is enhanced plant cultivars. And this is some work actually right now that's being done outside the federal government by a, uh, the Salk, Salk uh, Research Institute. Um, they are doing work on 
uh, modification of plant root systems to increase root capability to both make roots um, more robust and make them deeper. And, and in particular, uh, there's a material in the root structure called suberin, which is a bio, kind of a biopolymer material that is an excellent form of storing carbon because it does not break down very easily. And if you can grow crops or plants or trees with more robust root systems that can capture more suberin, you can put that into the soil and it will stay there for a very long time in a very stable state. This is one of the areas that we're looking at that the federal government, through the Department of Agriculture primarily, needs to be doing some more work on. Within DOE, um, ARPA-E, which some of you may have heard of, uh, the Advanced Research Projects Agency, Energy, had funded one set of projects in this same area called ROOTS, which was also doing some work in uh, looking at some of these same set of issues. And those research projects uh, are in the very uh, early stage of implement, implementation. Um, so when you're looking at biological and terrestrial research, what we're saying is that the, the objective here is to find ways to increase carbon uptake whether it's in trees, plants, and soils. Um, the biggest challenge here is you want to do that in a way, particularly if you're modifying plants, whether it's through um, uh, natural uh, breeding or genetically modified, which is also part of our portfolio. You want to do it in a way that is compatible with uh, traditional food and fiber research objectives. Um, one of the other areas, for example, that we are recommending that for research in this area is looking to see whether um, uh, crops can be uh, uh, transitioned from annual plants to perennials. And if you could grow perennial wheat, for example, you would have much less uh, disturbance of soil and much more retention of carbon in the soil. So we've identified four areas of research in the terrestrial space, the first one being the crop cultivars. And we think that that needs to be done through some combination of both uh, traditional breeding and genetic modification. Um, second area is in bioenergy. Uh, right now, there's a lot of research at DOE in bioenergy for trying to maximize the energy uh, uh, productivity from biomass and what we think needs to be done is that thinking about how those processes can also be optimized for uh, carbon capture. Um, biofuels with biochar is one kind of promising idea where biomass is uh, partly uh, gasified and with a, uh, a lot of the carbon then remaining behind in a biochar which can then be used as a soil amendment. The other thing that we've noticed is that the USDA has an extensive, an extensive research infrastructure, but it's not really working necessarily on the frontiers of these areas. And one of the things that was enacted in the most recent Farm Bill was Congress uh, uh, authorized a new organization within the Department of Agriculture called the uh, Ad Ad uh, Agricultural Advanced Research uh, uh, and Development Agency, or AGARDA. And uh, that office has yet to be stood up, but we think that that office could be, could take a leadership role in supporting this kind of, kind of cutting edge research. And last but not least, we do think that there's a need, and the Academy identified this, for just getting a better handle on the numbers uh, for the various terrestrial fluxes. Um, and uh, USDA is doing some work in this area and probably a lot more work needs to be done on enhanced monitoring uh, capabilities, including uh, remote sensing. And that's also uh, both a USDA and a uh, NASA uh, area of research. So let me shift now to mineralization. Mineralization is basically taking CO2, reacting it with an alkaline solid material, and forming a carbonate. And a carbonate is a solid material that's very stable. And one of the reasons it's very stable is that the CO2 mineralization process is exothermic. So it doesn't require you to add energy, it actually releases energy. 
The big problem with mineralization and energy is it's the energy to get the material together in a way that it can react with the CO2. It's the sort of the infrastructure issue. Two forms of CO2 mineralization, in situ and ex situ. Ex situ means basically, and again, most of this work is passive, where you would spread material on the surface and allow it to react with atmospheric CO2. And this can be natural rock formations that are highly alkaline, or it could be, in some cases, industrial waste that are highly alkaline. The in situ method means um, it's sort of like geologic sequestration, and frankly, it's a little bit like fracking, where you would uh, uh, drill into rock formations that are highly alkaline, uh, and where there are uh, fissures in those rock formations, whether they're naturally occurring or whether you would create them through fracking, you would then inject the CO2, and the CO2, rather than, would, rather than dissolving, it would just basically react with the rocks and form um, carbonate uh, in the subsurface. Um, there's a major research project right now on in, in situ mineralization going on in Iceland, where they're testing out some of these methods. So the process itself is very simple. It's exothermic, but it requires a lot of material. And, um, and it's a question of how, how extensive it, it and how well it might work. So here's the research portfolio that we're recommending in the mineralization area. The objective here really is, really need a much better assessment of the feasibility technically and the potential for mineralization. And there's a lot of research challenges here. One is just sort of the overall, I call it productivity, but it's basically what are the thermodynamics and the kinetics of mineralization and you know, for a given ton of rock or material, how much and how fast can you capture CO2? There's also the question of economics and infrastructure because, again, it would require moving large amounts of material or, in the case of in situ, uh, extensive uh, subsurface uh, drilling operations. So what we're recommending in the portfolio here is basically four areas. Some fundamental research on some of the chemistry and rock physics, uh, particularly focused on the kinetics of, the, of some of the reactions. Uh, the feasibility of whether one could use some of the man-made uh, sources of material for CO2 capture, like industrial waste. Um, and then there's frankly going to be a need for some field experiments to actually test this in the field to actually get some real-world measurements. And then last but not least, uh, some environmental research to understand the environmental impacts and to what extent they might pose a constraint on, on deployment. So let me go then to coastal and oceans. Oceans is very interesting because ocean chemistry is very complex. And carbon exists in the oceans in various forms. It's carbonate, bicarbonate, dissolved CO2. Uh, and it exists in the ocean in both acidic and alkaline forms. And so what you want to do is um, convert as much of that ocean carbon that's in an acidic form into an alkaline form. And a couple of different pathways that have been suggested in the science. One is uh, starting from the right going to the left. Uh, coastal, it's called blue carbon. And why it's called blue carbon, I don't know. But basically what it is is uh, coastal ecosystem and wetlands restoration where one and, uh, uh, restores certain plants and tree materials that absorb carbon into the roots and, and, and deposit the carbon in sediments. There's also two other major ocean uh, capture methods. One is um, uh, alkalinity modification, whether you would put certain uh, CO2 or uh, certain alkaline materials in the ocean and let it absorb the CO2 and convert it into carbonates or bicarbonates. And the other one is ocean fertilization, where you would try and stimulate more um, uh, microalgae uh, growth that would absorb carbon. And that becomes be, uh, can become a very uh, potential issue, uh, controversial issue. There have been, in, in our research, we found uh, somewhere between 12 and 15 experiments 
that have been done on ocean fertilization. Because there's large portions of the ocean, particularly like in the South Atlantic, where there's very little biota or biological growth. And iron is basically the limiting factor. Um, and uh, there have been some experiments to try and stimulate more growth by depositing iron filings. Um, the research projects that have been done to date have been very controversial and very um, uh, uh, inconclusive, and in part because the experiments have not been very well controlled. Um, uh, there was one experiment um, in the, uh, in the uh, Pacific Northwest where they dumped iron filings in the ocean in order to stimulate more uh, biological growth to uh, improve the salmon uh, uh, yield. And, uh, and there were controversial results of whether or not it really did or didn't do that. There's also some controversy as to what the side effects might be of doing that. Um, and so, and then last but not least, in dealing with the oceans, you have to deal with, you're dealing with an international regime, particularly in the open oceans. So what we're recommending is, in terms of research areas, is developing a better understanding of what ocean removal processes are and how they might work. And the real challenge is, if you're particularly in dealing in open ocean, how to create a controlled experiment. And also then, how do you take into account all of these very other complex interactions? And how do you make sure that you do this in a way that, that does not have um, adverse environmental side effects? And so the recommendations that we're making uh, are four in this area. One is that carbon dioxide removal needs to be thought about as and built into all of these ocean restoration programs. Right now, it, so that it's really a multi-function program or a multi-objective program. Secondly, we do need more fundamental research on both alkalinity enhancement and um, uh, also on uh, fertilization. And then thirdly, <clears throat> we need to think about um, doing experiments in the ocean. That's going to be controversial because it's going to have to be coordinated internationally. Um, there's the London Convention and the London Protocol that have set up uh, standards and procedures for doing that. Uh, they do not ban ocean experiments, but they set up tight protocols for that. The U.S. is a, is a signatory to the London Convention, and we've ratified that. It's a treaty. Uh, the U.S. has not been a signatory to the London Protocol, but um, as a practical matter, um, ocean scientists have generally been following it. All right, so two more areas I want to cover, geologic sequestration and utilization. Geologic sequestration, there have been a number of experiments already with geologic sequestration around the U.S. There are many possible geologies for geologic sequestration. And when I say geologic sequestration here, I mean basically um, uh, sequestering CO2 in um, deep underground saline aquifers being the primary um, uh, uh, recipient for the sequestration. Uh, most of this work has been funded by DOE through the carbon capture and sequestration program. A lot of it, this work has been managed out of the uh, National Energy Technology Laboratory here in uh, Pittsburgh. Uh, what we are recommending basically is that DOE is currently supporting a program called Carbon Safe, where they are doing uh, funding testing work at 19 different sites around the US, characterizing those sites for the potential for carbon sequestration. And basically, our recommendation is that that program seems to be a very soundly defined program. And our recommendation would be to do more and do it faster. And so what we are recommending is that that site characterization work proceed, that those 19 sites be down selected to ultimately maybe some number of a half a dozen to as many as eight or 10 that could ultimately become operating geologic sequestration sites and what we just need to do is large-scale testing. There are a number of issues with geologic sequestration, induced seismicity, questions about 
permanence of uh, storage, et cetera, et cetera. But the only way that we're going to be able to really get answers to those questions is by doing large scale experiments. And, and so that's going to be critical. Um, we are also, the other way of doing sequestration of CO2 is that CO2 is could also currently being used for enhanced oil recovery. Um, and that's kind of an, a, an established commercial process. What we are recommending is that thinking about using EOR in a different way. Right now, oil companies minimize the amount of CO2 that they have to inject in order to maximize a barrel of oil produced. There are other ways to do CO2 for EOR where you could maximize the amount of CO2 per barrel of oil that you produce. And then and by doing so then probably uh, create uh, maybe as many as four times as much CO2 injected per barrel of oil produced. And we do recommend some research in that area. And then last but not least, recommend research on subsurface monitoring technologies. A lot of work's been done by the DOE National Laboratories in this space. And if we are going to do large scale sequestration, we need to better understand what's happening down there. Utilization, uh, last area I want to cover here. Um, there are a number of different ways in which CO2 can be utilized, and there are a number of different pathways, both for the conversion and the ultimate product. Um, I won't go into all of these, but other than to say the biggest challenge is the energy of conversion. CO2 is a very stable molecule, and if you want to convert it into something else, it takes a lot of energy. Right now, there's a very limited commercial market for CO2. The biggest market, that bar in the middle, that's 46 megatons a year of CO2 that's currently being used for enhanced oil recovery. And most of that, almost all of that, is coming from natural CO2 and not from captured CO2. The other markets, even food and beverage, which people think about in terms of things like carbonation, are very, very small. And that's one of the other issues with CO2 utilization. It's small and very diffuse markets. Nonetheless, CO2 utilization is an area that's been attracting a lot of innovators. And there's a lot of, and this is a, uh, we, we again tried to do a, a little bit of a survey to see who's doing work in the space. And this little cartoon just shows that there are a number of, a, a lot of companies out there uh, most of them startup companies, uh, some major companies, but mostly startups, that have been looking at using CO2 for various applications, whether it's fuels conversion, um, putting it into cement and ultimately concrete, um, using it for various uh, uh, carbon-based products. Uh, so there is a lot of innovation going on there right now among a lot of companies. Uh, and so what we're recommending here is that the federal government can probably help accelerate a lot of this work that's certainly currently being innovated um, by supporting some of the more earlier stage fundamental and applied research, primarily looking at the conversion processes, whether they're chemical conversion processes or biological conversion processes. Um, the other thing we need to think about is how we assess the scale, the scalability of these industries because again, if it's not things like en enhanced soil recovery or concrete or in aggregates, the other markets are not going to be very large applications for CO2. Uh, and then the last piece, uh, particularly with respect to uh, aggregates and concrete, uh, testing measures to um, assess the materials properties of CO2 infused concrete to make sure that it meets uh, standards that we need for roads and buildings. Um, lastly here, I just cross-cutting efforts. I just want to just throw this up as a, just mention this very briefly. There are needs for cross-cutting things that are not pathway specific. We need more data on life cycle carbon emissions across all of these pathways. We need more comprehensive techno-economic assessments. I talked about it with DAC, but we need it in all the areas. Uh, we need more large-scale modeling to understand carbon impacts in the environment. And then we also are recommending what we're calling a decision science research program, which is really um, 
social science. If one are really thinking about <coughs> uh, CDR at a large scale, one needs to think very hard about public acceptance. And uh, we think there are some issues there that need to be very carefully thought through. And last but not least, large-scale demonstrations. We think that ultimately some of these pathways are going to need to be demonstrated at a large scale. And what we're proposing to do is to set up a separate fund uh, for the federal government to cost share that, those kinds of demonstrations and to manage them separately. <coughs> this then gets me to the, the budget slides. And I'll just show two slides here. The first shows the, um, the scale of the federal program that we're recommending, starting at about $300 million a year. Within the first five years, ramping up to over a billion dollars a year. Over the 10-year period, about $10 billion total. Um, and the various colors show the different pathways that we've put together. The top line in the blue, which phases in toward the end, is the uh, large-scale demonstration program. And this slide here, this pie graph, shows how the 10-year monies would be allocated by pathway. And as you can see, it's a very diversified portfolio uh, by design, where about half of the money would be going into looking at pathway-specific approaches. About a quarter of the funding would go into disposition pathways. And about another quarter of the money would go into these cross-cutting programs and, uh, and large-scale demonstrations. Ten research agencies plus two agencies in the executive office of the president. How do you make sure that this program gets put together and run in a way that's integrated and coordinated? We've also done a lot of work in this. This is an area that our funding sponsors asked us to look at. And we did um, uh, some analysis of how other major federal research initiatives, whether it's information technology, climate change science, nanotechnology that cross a number of agencies, how they've been organized and managed. And what we're recommending here is a sort of a committee structure that would be managing carbon dioxide removal. It would be run out of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Um, the three principal agencies that would be, fun, that would be doing the work, Department of Energy, Agriculture, and NOAA would be uh, executive co-chairs and that we would um, uh, talk about the uh, different working groups. Uh, we spent a lot of time in our report talking about this because the governance issue becomes a very important issue. And in fact, in some of the earlier discussions we've been having on Capitol Hill, this becomes a, an important area for them to think about in terms of legislation, in terms of how one gets something like this um, off the ground. And then last but not least, I want to just mention a word about international collaboration. Other countries have been doing work on carbon dioxide removal. I mentioned a few examples uh, with uh, direct air capture and mineralization. Um, I believe the South Koreans are planning to do an experiment with uh, oceans capture. We want to be able to also build out an international collaboration effort and also, quite frankly, get other countries interested in ultimately deploying CDR. The mechanism that we're recommending is something called Mission Innovation, which was also launched as part of the Paris Agreement, which is a 20-plus country initiative that's looking at a variety of clean energy technologies uh, and how the countries can work together. Um, and it spans everything from solar energy to energy storage um, uh, to uh, nuclear. And uh, one of the things we would like to do is have carbon dioxide removal added as a formal element uh, to mission innovation and to try and bring other countries into the planning and coordination of this effort. So let me just conclude by saying that what the project that we have been working on here is to put together a very detailed set. Some of it is what I call bureaucratic mechanics of how one would put together a major research initiative for carbon dioxide removal. We think it's important because it provides optionality and flexibility, both to address temperature goals, 
but also to address some of the problems with current atmospheric concentrations. We think if it's properly structured, it can have important co-benefits. Reducing acidity in the oceans has other benefits. Um, improving uh, crops and trees have other benefits in agriculture. And there's also even a national security dimension to all of this as well. And then uh, fourthly, we think there's a, uh, important economic benefits longer term. Because again, if we are talking about creating CDR industries that will be operating at a gigaton scale, we are talking about creating very large new industries in the decades ahead. And then last but not least, in our report, we spent a lot of time thinking about how to justify a research initiative of $10 billion to an administration in Congress that, that is properly defined, highly disciplined, and focused on trying to uh, uh, bring forward some uh, very concrete results here within a decade. So with that, I'll kind of end it here and would really would welcome any comments or uh, questions. Any questions? Question in the back. Thank you for the presentation. I wanted to ask you about the 351 universities which have ratified the Paris Agreement, and is CMU one of them? I'll defer that one to uh, <laughs> Anna. So, like, <laughs> So CMU has made um, quite a few different commitments, but we're not a, an organization that would commit to that particular one. I think we would be a part of an organization that would, however. Uh, we have a new sustainability initiative that was just announced last week. Are there other questions? Question in the back, yes. Has there been any cooperation with the uh, fracking industry, the gas and oil industry, to work and uh, do some research uh, to help out with this issue? I, th it seems like a no-brainer that they would buy into uh, doing mm. some research with you. There, there. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the answer is yes. The um, the uh, oil and gas industry um, has an interest in this area and they've actually invested some monies into some research projects. Um, uh, there are two companies in particular, and again I'm not making an advertisement for them, but Occidental Petroleum for example um, has made an investment in uh, the carbon engineering company and they're proposing to build a um, uh, project down in uh, the Permian Basin and their notion is to capture CO2 from the atmosphere and then use it in their enhanced oil recovery operations. Uh, Chevron has also made it, uh, an investment in, uh, uh, in, uh, in direct air capture. And there's an initiative that the industry has just started recently called the um, Oil and Gas Climate Initiative, which is a pooling of resources to invest in um, climate related research and we've been talking with them about doing some uh, support in this area. So you're right, I mean, and then when you think about the ultimate scale for deployment, you need an oil and gas industry company level scale in order to be able to deploy this. So this is not, while the innovators in some of the areas could be small, ultimately the deployment has to be very large scale. Other questions? <coughs> Um, thank you for that presentation. It was really interesting. I was curious about if um, countries like Norway that have carbon offsetting projects, if you've seen sort of an industry preference in these new um, technologies for carbon sequestration from commercial entities. So for example, are the equinors of the world now interested in carbon sequestration because that would decrease the cost that they have to pay in carbon offsets? Uh, yeah, Equinor in particular is doing, as you probably are aware, they are doing a project in the North Sea 
where they're um, injecting CO2 uh, uh, in, the, in the seabed in, uh, in some of their oil reservoirs. But I believe that the CO2 that they're using, I'm not quite sure what this, I know it's not from, the, it's not atmospheric, but, but there's some talk about potentially doing something like that. And there's some similar discussions going on, I believe, the, in the Netherlands about doing um, atmospheric uh, carbon dioxide removal and, uh, and injection. So it's an area that's getting a lot of interest right now, and uh, at least in the research area. And I think that's what we need to see to begin to see whether these things really prove out, and particularly the economics, because there's a lot of controversy over what the cost ultimately is going to be. Uh, thanks for the presentation. It was really interesting. Um, I'm wondering about the different markets where CO2 could be utilized. You mentioned the uh, oil and gas industry being the biggest one, but which market do you see as the, the biggest growth potential for uh, CO2 utilization? I would have to say um, <clears throat> concrete and aggregates. Um, people are thinking about concrete now. There's a couple of companies that are doing uh, CO2 as part of the curing process there. Um, looks kind of interesting. Um, one of the um, major venture capital firms, the uh, Breakthrough Energy Ventures, the group that, w that um, Bill Gates started a few years ago, has made an investment in one of those companies. But actually, when you look at the scale of it, the, the bigger potential market might be aggregates. We're creating uh, carbonate materials, whether it's used for not the pavement material, but the roadbed or for other things like that. I mean, you know, where you could see potentially large scale. It's large scale, but not high value added. That's the, that's the, that's the trade-off. The high value added stuff tends to be much smaller in, in, in scale. One last question. Thank you for the presentation. Um, so I had a question kind of about efficiency. Um, if we're using direct um, capture technology on ambient air, is it even possible to collect 10 gigatons of carbon? Um, because it's 0.04%. <laughs> so, I mean, what kind of efficiency would you have to reach or what scale would mm. you have to get to? Yeah, People to, are to actually... talking about commercial scale DAC facilities that on the order of 500 megatons a year. But that is an, off that is an awfully large facility. Um, and, um, um, and particularly with the, the low temperature solid absorbent where you have these, these, these fans that are capturing air, you need a lot of land area to do that because the other thing you have to do, it's sort of like wind turbines, you, you, you have to worry about the placement of these machines because you don't want, you know, once you deplete CO2 from the air, you don't want the next machine to be sucking in depleted air with depleted CO2. So it, it's, it's an issue. And I think that's one of the things that why we're recommending, again, uh, I would say what we're recommending here we think is a somewhat conservative program because we're saying let's do five years of research. Let's take the best ideas from that. And then let's take those to kind of large scale demonstration. You will find people out there in the community, particularly in the environmental community, who would want to rush into something tomorrow. And so we're trying to find this middle ground and at the same time trying to find a program that you could take to the current Congress and say this is something that you could buy into and provide the funding for. So, but I know it's a long-winded answer to your question, which again, I think the, the answer is right now we don't know for sure, but we think the potential might be there. Joe, thank you so much for the presentation today. Um, as he mentioned earlier, uh, the report is actually coming out next Tuesday with a big announcement. And so we have been videotaping this session. It will be available on our website next week, sort of at the end of the week. Um, but as a token as of our oh. appreciation, we just wanted to say thank, thank you, you for being here today. And uh, we're very glad to have you. Um, a reminder um, to all of you, please uh, grab a plate as you're leaving. If you'd like, the composting bins are by the door. And we will see you next on October. October 2nd. Thank you very much.